It's the second hour of the show today, all about dealing with social media and what we can do as parents to help our teens navigate these platforms and put social spaces uh, as safely as we can possibly make it for them. With me in studio, it's a great pleasure to welcome Rochelle Best, who's the founder of FYI Play It Safe, a platform that um, alerts parents when kids encounter potentially harmful content. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that just now, but she's also the creator of Sip the Tea, which is a podcast series that speaks to South African teens about the situations they're encountering on social media. Rochelle, lovely to have you with us. Thanks so much for having me, Papa. Welcome. Welcome to, to another familiar voice to our audience. I think Dean McCubrey, the founder of My Social Life, all about digital education, growing responsible digital citizens and how we educate parents as well as the teens. Dean, it's always great to have you with us. Welcome back. Also, thank you for having me. And then our third guest, tuning in via Zoom from the Garden Route, Pam tuden Bookalter, who is a clinical psychologist and the co-founder of Clicked. K-L-I-K-D. It's a platform that also helps parents and educators and teens to use social media safely and responsibly. Engage with strangers online being one of the key risks because you never know who is on the other side of that screen. Rochelle, I mean, I know this is something you're passionate about, the fact that we don't know. Somebody may purport to be one thing on social media and could be somebody else entirely. Is that, you think, one of the biggest risks we need to try and drum into our kids, that they may think they're having a conversation with another teenager at another school down the road, but in fact that could be somebody 30 or 40 years older? Definitely, Papa. And I think if you if you look at what we've heard in, in Sip the Tea, I mean, the reason for Sip the Tea was to have some of these open conversations, you know, where we didn't even want to talk about the risks. We wanted to explore... What do you really see online? What are you exposed to? And um, and some of the stories. I mean, I I talked to one to one boy who on Musically met who he thought was his first girlfriend, and now Musically is the, the predecessor of TikTok. Okay. Um, and it used to be quite a quite a fun platform um, before TikTok <laughs> took uh, took over. But uh, he met his first girlfriend online. And long story short, but when when his mom came across his account and and looked at the chats. You know, it it was he names it as um, as a pedophile sure. uh, who he was engaging with and and having had all sorts of role plays that you know he describes in in quite a bit of detail. So it's definitely one of the dangers that we have to drill into their heads that the person on the avatar, the person on the picture, is not necessarily the person you you talk to, and you have to do more investigation before giving out any sort of personal information. Mm. Dean, I know you always speak a lot about family values and what values have embedded your kids and and obviously building that groundwork if you've built a groundwork with a solid relationship of trust with your kids where you talk about these things and they feel they can come to you uh, in times of uncertainty it's a good starting point um but yeah a situation like this uh, uh, i can imagine i've got a teenage boy in the house the appeal of the person on the other end of the computer screen who is attractive to you and who is potentially your first girlfriend at a time where there's so much buzz around these things, how easy is it for them to forget that, that, that even the most strongly embedded values background? It's incredibly difficult. I think, uh, you know, what we don't, what we can never truly understand is what it's like to be an 11, 12, 13, 14 year old. Even though we can cast our mind back, we can't, it's it's so far away that you can never quite get it. And of course, we also don't know how much critical thinking skills have been taught to them by their school, as an example. Yeah. And furthermore, to some degree, how much critical thinking skills have we given them? And there's one other piece of the puzzle as well, which is, um, you know, when we uh, speak to children, when we teach them, about 60% of them say that they will share something and 40% say that they won't with their parent. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons for that is not necessarily because they're bad kids. It's because they love their parents, because they're embarrassed, because they feel ashamed and so on. So all of that is incredibly difficult. Mm -hmm. So to your point, I think we need to have incredible empathy with our kids. We gave them the devices, we've connected them, and yet we perhaps haven't done enough with regards to critical thinking and we don't have enough perhaps regular check-ins we perhaps overlook the fact that uh, these are realities that they will be predated or yeah. attempted uh, you know efforts for people to make contact with them it's I just I can't say enough how uh, empathetic I feel towards the kids yeah. so we need to work harder is, is the solution Pam, I'd love to bring you in here from the clinical psychologist background. I mean, Dean's talking about such important things about having that relationship of trust where your kids can come to you. And even if you do have that, it's not necessarily enough. 
But what can we do as parents to firstly make it easier for them to have that conversation with us to say, I have stumbled upon something or perhaps even gone looking for it and found more than I thought I was going to find. We might be talking about porn. We might be talking about something else. But what can we do as parents to make it easier for them to come to us in that position? So I love what Dean is saying in terms of equipping them with critical thinking. But I think the second part of that is that we have to be the soft landing place. So, you know, very quickly when we have a child who who goes looking for porn, our first reaction might be, give me that device, never letting you have it again, as opposed to firstly normalizing that what they went looking for, um, you know, really was some excitement. That is age appropriate, developmentally appropriate, risk-taking behavior is what the teen brain needs actually in order to eventually leave home. So a certain amount of, I'm going to hear you out first. And then with that, we have to get real, right? So you have to know your own position on those things. What your family value base is, is one part of that. But the second part is being actually able and ready to engage your child and have that hard conversation. So it might really stick in your side. But if you can say, you know what, sweetheart, if you're going to go looking, we need to have this conversation. And we need to talk about things like that's not how it is in real life. In fact, more than anything, I've also got teen boys in the house. Um, and I know how much you want to get out there and kiss that girl or that girl. That's not how it looks in real life. And what what porn is going to do is set up the brain for a dopamine hit to talk about what is a dopamine hit. How when you get more and more, you need more and more. You know, you need more of a kick in order to feel less ultimately. Those kinds of conversations. And most importantly, to say, I'm appreciating that we're having this chat. Because what it says is when things go wrong, if you send a nude, if you receive a nude, if you do bully someone online and you come and tell me the consequence, I'm not saying no punishment. I'm saying that the consequence comes second, that I have your back comes first. Let's talk about what went down. I'm, I'm open to hearing as opposed to, you know, the child who accidentally discovers porn on Roblox when they're 10 years old mm. is a different conversation altogether, but it's still about being the soft landing place. It's still about saying, gee, I'm so glad you came to tell me. That must have been quite scary. You were just playing a game. What did you actually see? And then when you talk about, you know, they give you a description, you need to make sense of that for the child. A 10-year-old doesn't understand when they're seeing oral sex, what that may be. You need to say when two adults love each other, sometimes they need to make each other's bodies feel nice and they want to make each other's bodies feel nice. But that is an adult thing to do. So, you know, that kind of explanation gives a tacit message to a child. This is the place I go to to find out information or to share when I'm troubled, as opposed to, oh, my soul, this looks dangerous. And I know that if I go and tell, my device is gone. Yeah. Later, it's like, okay, we need to talk about how we're going to manage this. You know, what I love what you say there, Pam, I think is so important is that 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 sense of being willing to engage, even if every fiber of your being is screaming that you don't want to have this conversation. Many of us are being raised by parents and have had the influence of grandparents who were of a generation where you did not discuss that at all. It was dirty. It was shamed. It was not to be talked about in decent society. And it's very hard to break that generational history. If you were parented one way uh, that said we don't have those conversations in our house. Um, I mean, do you, what advice for a parent who has been raised like that, who's been raised with, we don't talk about these things when the child comes and it, it, it's really hard for you to do that. Is it perhaps important to say that to the child, that this is a difficult conversation for me to have? Absolutely. As hard as it is for you, it is for me. But I don't want you to get to a place that where I got to as an adult, where I wish that my parent had spoken to me. You know, and to to kind of lay off the sanctimony of it and the the lecture of it, and just say, "Geez, we're both having a hard time here, mm-hmm. but let's try push through." You know, um, to make light. Sometimes it's also okay to make light, and and kids appreciate that. You know, geez, I'm also having a hard time. It's like, oh, my soul, my mother's also not dealing here. It's great. It's great. Yeah, for sure. We have to break those cycles in the same way that there are many cycles of our own parenting that we want to change. Yeah. This is just one of them.